Let's look together today at God's sovereign prerogative. We are looking at this amazing doxology of the Apostle Paul that is found in Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Let's read the entire doxology together as he worships God for his greatness. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. A doxology is a sudden burst of praise and worship that comes from a person who's overwhelmed with their understanding of the greatness and glory of God. And here in the book of Romans, as Paul is writing to us about the grace of God and justification of our sins by faith in Christ, as he writes about righteousness from God as a gift, not something we earn for, and tells us that there's no condemnation against us in Christ Jesus, he reminds us that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And here in Romans, he begins to contemplate on the sovereignty of God, God's governance of the world, God's foreknowledge and predestination, these amazing great truths of how great God is. And suddenly he bursts forth in a doxology. In this part of the doxology we look at today, we see God's sovereign prerogative. God is sovereign. The word sovereign is the same word for a king or a queen, one with absolute authority. And God is the king of the universe. So God governs is what sovereignty means. It doesn't mean he makes everything happen in this world because he's given us freedom of choice, but it means that everything we choose happens within the boundaries of what he will permit. It doesn't mean that everything in your life is predetermined because you have the ability to make decisions and seek God's counsel and wisdom. But God does will your existence into being. You're not here by accident. That's sovereignty. That God has provided a plan for your life and will lead you and guide you in the perfection of his will if you will trust him. So sovereignty involves both God's prerogative and and the space he gives us and the freedom he gives us to make our own decisions within the larger boundaries of his will. But here Paul looks at God's sovereign prerogative, which means God makes his own decisions. God has the executive decision-making power over everything. God has veto power, we might use in a political sense, when Congress can pass a law. But it goes to a president's desk, and the president either signs it into law or vetoes it and undoes all the work. We're kind of like Congress at times. We make certain decisions that that God has veto power. God ultimately reigns. In that sense, God is in control. God governs. And that's why the world never spins out of control, even though that humanity at times is out of control. So the sovereign prerogative of God means that God has the right within himself as God to make whatever decision he deems is best. And faith is learning to trust God's sovereign prerogative, his decision in your life. And many times we don't know why. There's just what, what God wills, what God decrees. And faith learns to accept that because God is omnipotent and God knows everything and God is all wise. And so we trust him. So the word sovereignty means that God governs as a king. It also means that he has the authority and the right to command our obedience because he made us in his image. He ultimately controls the events of the world so that the world is always governed by his love and grace and purpose. God governs this vast universe that he created, and he governs everything and everyone in it. King David expressed this thought in Psalm 103, verse 19, when he writes, "'The Lord has established his throne in the heavens.'" and his kingdom rules over all. What assurance that last phrase is. His kingdom, his government rules over all. Whatever nation you're in, whatever kind of government that country may have, there's a greater government. He rules over all. 
So here we learn that God makes executive decisions that will fulfill his will and purpose and his decisions benefit us. Now, a good parent makes the best decision for the family and for the kids. Now, our problem is that we often question God, challenge his wisdom, and rebel against his will. Our pride leads us to our own destruction and downfall. Now, when we answer these three questions that Paul raises in the doxology, and we answer them correctly, we learn the power of humility, trust, and total obedience. Growing up in our family with my parents, there were five kids. I do remember one time my dad telling us kids, oh, this is not a democracy, this is a dictatorship. At the time, I wasn't really exactly sure which either one was, but I remember that statement. And he would say it occasionally, just to remind us that he and my mother had sovereign prerogative. They made the executive decisions. They didn't ask us about where we thought we ought to go to school, where we thought we ought to go to church. They didn't bring us into the decision-making process on the big decisions of our family. They are the parents. They raised us. They provided for us. It is their wisdom that makes the decisions. And so I learned to trust that. And for me personally, it's very easy for me to trust God because I had loving parents and I just was raised not to question, but to trust. And they always provided and protected. And in that sense, it's easy for me to connect with the truth that God has a sovereign prerogative and that I want to submit to that part of his will. Other people have a little more difficulty with that, but it's a place we all need to get to because God may decide things that you don't like. And there were certainly times my parents did things and we had to go places. I remember one Christmas, we always were at home on Christmas, but on this particular Christmas, after we had our Christmas, we had to go to somebody's house that afternoon. And I remember having to stop playing with my toys and getting dressed, how much I did not like that Christmas afternoon. So there are times that you have to do things in God's sovereign prerogative because you trust him, not necessarily because you think it's what you want for your life. But that's really the maturity of faith when you can trust God with your life and you can pray for his wisdom and direction. And when you know you're in God's will, even though you may be going through some difficult times, you're not questioning God. That's a part of walking by faith. And you'll always be blessed. You'll always prosper when you live in a state of trust to God's will for your life and allow him to make the executive decisions. He's given you freedom of choice for many decisions, but there are things in our lives where we need to trust his executive decision. And so Paul raises these three questions to help us understand our relationship to God so that we don't think we're God or we're in charge. And that's what pride is all about. It's about governing ourselves as if God did not exist. So the first question he asks us to think about our relationship with God and, and to really evaluate whether or not we're in submission to God and we trust God, he asks us the question, who has known the mind of the Lord in Isaiah 40, verse 13? Now, the context in which Isaiah asked the people of God this question was when the nation went into Babylonian exile. And when they were there, they felt that God had abandoned them. And who could foresee, though, that God had a plan to bring them out? And maybe you feel like you've been exiled today. You feel like God's given up on you, but God had a plan to bring them out. And he was asking them, who knows the mind of the Lord? You're stuck where you are in the moment, but God knows all things. So you and I know what's happening right now, but God knows what's going to happen in the future. We don't have that foresight, but he does. And so we can trust him. These people in Babylon felt that all hope was over. They had no hope of national restoration as a people. Psalm 137 verses 1 through 3 was written by the psalmist in exile when he says, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? He said, we took our harps and we hung it on the poplar trees. They'd given up their song. They had no sense of hope. But it was in that hopelessness that the prophet Jeremiah tells them that God has a plan. They don't know his mind. They don't know his purpose. But they didn't need to think that that was the end of their destiny. Now listen to how Jeremiah encourages them to trust God's counsel. 
This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That's Jeremiah 29, verses 10 through 13. So God knew the plan he had for the people, but they didn't know the plan. And we don't know the plan. But the awareness of the fact that God does have a plan for our lives gives us assurance, even when we live in an anxious world. Who has known the mind of the Lord? We don't know his mind. We can't understand everything God does. We don't know the reason behind everything. But we can trust him when we recognize that God has a sovereign prerogative to make decisions. The second question he asks is, who has been his counselor? This is a thought-provoking question to me because as a pastor, I'm a counselor. I'm a licensed therapist, and so this intrigues me, this question. A lot of people need counseling, and it's a great ministry, but God does not need counseling. Who's been his counselor? Who of us is going to sit down with God and tell him how he ought to run things? You can see the absurdity of trying to do that, and yet there are times that we want to advise God on how he should run the world. It's amazing how many people have the, a better idea, they think, than God as to how things ought to unfold in history. There are some people that even pray about the weather. Personally, I've never done that. I just trust him. I figure God can control the weather. Some people wonder why Jesus delays his second coming. I get asked that question a lot as a pastor. I have no earthly idea, but I know that God will make that decision at the right time. I trust his plan. The disciples questioned Jesus about his second coming in Acts chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. He said, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said, it is not for you to know the times that the Father is set by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses. He told them, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. Who would ever counsel God to redeem the world through the cross and the atonement of Jesus? That's the greatest mystery in the world. Would that have been our advice to God as to how he would atone for sins? Yet, the eternal counsel of God before the creation of the world determined to do just that, to redeem the world through the cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to, to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved it is the power of God. It's, the cross is foolishness to the human mind. The human mind can't comprehend how a cross could be so redemptive, and yet it is, because we trust the counsel and plan of God. The third question he asks is, who is God in debt to? Now, we live in a world of finance and borrow money and knowing what debt is all about. He said, who has ever given to God that God should repay him? Who's ever loaned money to God? Who is God obligated to is the point of the question. Now, this question comes from the book of Job, chapter 41, verse 11, when God asked this question to Job himself, and Job was questioning God. God said to him, Job, who's ever given to me that I should repay him? Who is God in debt to? The point is, does God owe us anything, really? You see, that is that sense of pride that God owes us something, that God is somehow obligated to us. Who can look up to heaven and demand payment from God or insult the Almighty, saying, Lord, you owe me? Rather, we are totally dependent on the Lord. For in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28 tells us. One of my favorite Bible verses is found right here in this part of Romans, a little earlier, Romans 9, verse 20. I love this question that Paul asks, but who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it? Why did you make me like this? That question is so thought-provoking. Who am I to talk back to God? I mean, I was raised not to talk back to my parents. That was one thing you didn't want to do. I was taught to respect them and to understand their authority, their sovereign prerogative. But he helps us get a grip on ourselves and sometimes our pride or our arrogance, assuming we know everything. We know so little, and God knows all things. So we can trust God's decisions in all things. God chose to redeem the world through a cross, the greatest mystery. 
It's his sovereign prerogative. What a great example of God's choice to do what is best for us, even in ways that we don't understand. And if you'll trust God with your life and you'll learn to trust his sovereignty, you'll find incredible peace. God has a perfect plan for your life. God will give you wisdom for every major decision that you are facing today. And when you find yourself in a place that you're not really pleased with all of your circumstances, as we all do, you don't have to get angry at God or question God, but trust God to lead you and guide you through the difficult time into a better place. He always has a plan for you, a plan to prosper you, not to harm you. His plan is to give you a future filled with hope. Join me for prayer. Father, I pray that the word of God today will help us all grow in faith, grow in that deep sense of trust of your wisdom, your power, and your goodness to acknowledge you alone are God, and we trust you with all of our hearts in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining me for the study of the word of God today. Let me encourage you to get your friends and family to watch and to listen, to study the Bible together. That's how we grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for your partnership in ministry, for praying for the ministries of the church, for praying for our missions work all around the world and here in the great city of Atlanta. Thank you also for your financial support of tithes and offerings to remember the work of the Lord here that comes forth from Mount Perrin. Your faithful partnership is so important to our ministry together. This Sunday's coming, we're looking forward to a great day of worship incredible music, hearing the Word of God together. I'm looking forward to seeing you and your family on campus. If you're not able to be with us, certainly online. Invite somebody to come to church with you this Sunday. God bless you. Have a great day.